going to squirt up and hit you in the face if you do it too quickly. I don't know whether anybody else is as well. Um, we're looking at the topic this morning of being loved and accepted. And just as a sort of segue into that, one of the ways we celebrate being loved and accepted is through taking communion. Because we're recognising that we're part of something, that we've been accepted into something. And that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to talk about the fact that we have been loved and accepted by God. And we are part, we are now into our second week of a six-week series looking at our identity in Jesus, who we are in him. And we do this topic regularly as a church. So last year we looked at this, the year before we looked at this, because it is so important that we continue to build solid foundations in our lives on who Jesus tells us that we are. And we have to keep coming back to it again and again and again because it's so easy to slip away from it or to maybe forget certain things about it. But also it's something that we need to kind of keep reinforcing over and over again. Who are we in Jesus? And so last week, Jazz spoke about the fact that we are called and chosen by God. And today we're looking at being loved and accepted. And I think the, the danger is, and I said this last time I spoke on the cross, but the danger is with certain topics of teaching, we can get a bit blasé if we've been Christians for a while, because we can sort of think, well, I've heard that before. I don't, I don't need to hear it again. Um, you know, if we make light of it or ignore certain topics of teaching, what can end up happening to us as Christians is we end up not really growing into who God wants us to become. Because what we do is we kind of, we kind of minimise certain things that are really important. And so as I speak this morning, just to really encourage you, I'm sure if you've been a Christian a while, you will have heard somebody speak on the fact that you are loved and accepted by God before. But this is not an opportunity for you to go on WhatsApp and text your friends or um, to check the news. This is an opportunity, again, just to remind yourself of who God says you are this morning. And so... As we start today, I just, I'm going to jump straight in and I'm going to talk about what the Bible teaches us about what, what, what is love and, and how God loves us. So there's three things I just want to talk on really quickly on this. So what does the Bible teach us about God's love? Well, first of all, that love defines the very nature of who God is. So John, all, all of my quotes are from the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, who, um, and he speaks a lot about love. But John says that God is love. John says that at the very heart of God, there is love. What's he getting at? Well, he's saying between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the Trinity, there is total love. There's total community. God is a being of love. Father, Son, and Spirit coexisting eternally, loving one another. God is love, says John. So love defines the nature of of who God is. Secondly, we find that as we read the Bible, we see that God loves everything that he's made. So John 3.16, if you don't know Jesus, you probably know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I'll just say this. I, I mean, I've grown up in church and, and, and there, is, there should be, if you're a Christian, you should expect Jesus to come back at any moment in time. And we should, we should expect that. The danger is, is that what we can do is we think, well, Jesus is coming back, so it doesn't really matter what I do with the world around me. Yeah, so, oh, well, I won't bother putting my recycling out on Thursday because Jesus might come back. So I'll just put all my plastic in with my food waste, yeah? But actually, it says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God loves his creation. And as humans, we've actually been told that we need to tend for and care for what God has made. So in, in Genesis, Adam and Eve are given the very specific task of caring for creation. You and I, as humans, have been told to do something by God, and a lot of humanity isn't doing it, not caring for creation. We should be role modelling it rather than just going along with putting our um, plastics and our papers together, right? We need to make sure that we actually are modelling what that looks like. God so loved the world. God loves everything. That's what I'm trying to say. Everything that he has made. But there is something else very specific. So in the nature of God, there is love and God loves everything. But in a very specific and a very special way, God has extended it, his love towards you as an individual. God's love has been extended towards you. Last, last week, Jazz spoke from Ephesians chapter one. It says something like, um, uh, the, the, before the creation of the world, you were chosen to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined you. God chose you. There was a love that God placed upon you as an individual. 
He chose you. And I'm speaking to you, not the person next to you. Some of us will go, oh, he's not speaking to me, he's speaking to the person next to me. I'm speaking to you. God has chosen you as an individual. Deuteronomy 7.7 7 says that God chose to set his affections on a particular group of people, not for any other reason other than that he chooses to do it. Now, I'm going through the Bible in one year this year, Claire and, Claire and I are doing it together, and we're reading Genesis at the moment because that's where we're at, and we were talking last night about the fact that every character in Genesis, they're just horrible, I don't know if you noticed that. Like, Jacob, he's just, oh, he's a horrible bloke. Isaac, he's a horrible bloke. Their wives are just as bad. They, like, mistreat their slaves. They don't really care about each other. They lie to one another. They trick each other into doing all sorts of awful things. But God chooses them. God doesn't choose them because they're good. God chooses them. Does that make sense? Now, for you and I, that should speak to us. It should speak to us about something that God does. He chooses to love you. Not because you're special but because he chooses to make you special. God chooses to extend his love towards you. As John says in 1 John 3 verse 1, God lavishes his love on his children. And this is not a sentimental, soppy, Valentine's Day card and box of chocolates type love. God's love is self-sacrificing and self-giving. When I spoke on the cross last time out, if you want to listen to it, you can do it, it's online. What I said was is God's love is demonstrated in that he dies for us. As it says in, uh, as John again says, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? That, that in Jesus, the wrath of God was placed. The anger of God against our sin was taken on by Jesus. He is the, the propitiation for us. It's a long and complicated word. But it's important that we, set, we, we, we preach it. We sung it in the song we just sung before we, we sat down. That God's wrath, God's anger against sin was placed upon the Son. And the Son willingly took it on. And how, how does this then play out? So, well, we find more out about God's love when we start to talk about what it means to be accepted by God. So, what does the Bible teach us about our acceptance from God? Well, we have been invited. We have been welcomed. We have brought, been brought into not only his presence, but his family. You've been found acceptable to God. That's what the Bible will teach us. The dwelling place of God is like one of the constant and key themes in scripture. So first he dwells with Adam and Eve. And then as a result of their sin, he has to dwell with his people in, in the form, first of all, in a tent and then in the temple. But always separated from them because they were not acceptable to him. You see, they failed, the people of God failed to meet the required standard of goodness and holiness to enter into the presence of God. So God dwelt with them, but he dwelt with them in separation. Yet through Jesus, the Bible teaches us that the way is opened to you and I. You've been made acceptable to God. Now, you are the dwelling place of God by the Holy Spirit. This is the wonder of the New Testament. That, that God not only chooses you to be his child, that he frees you from sin, but that he chooses to come and dwell within you. Paul says in Corinthians that you've become a temple for the Spirit of God. God dwells within you. God dwells within you. You see, our acceptance, though, isn't through our effort. It isn't through our goodness. It isn't because we deserved it, but it's because God chose us. God chose to uh, die on our behalf. God chose to take our unrighteousness, our unacceptability, and our unholiness away from us. God takes our sin away, and he places it on himself and chooses to forgive us. There was a time when each of us was not acceptable to God. As Paul says in Romans, as I've said already, you were an object of wrath. You were an object of the wrath of God. As Paul says in Ephesians, he says, don't carry on like the Gentiles, who he says are corrupt and given over to deceitful desires. Well, we were all like that before we came to Jesus. Our hearts were given over to every kind of impurity. We were broken, we walked in darkness, and we were unable to redeem ourselves. If you're not a Christian... The Bible says that your very nature is corrupted from God's original design for you. And so what that means is, is that means that there's a default setting in your heart that's set wrong. It means that, that when you desire to do something good, you're desiring it out of your, for yourself. And you actually, all you really care about underneath absolutely everything else is self-desire and self-worship. 
There's a default setting that's wrong in you if you don't know Jesus. But it's only because of Jesus, says the Bible, that you can be changed. Jesus says no one can come to God except through me. There isn't another religious system that will work. There isn't another set of self-help books that will work for you. There isn't any other lifestyle that you can change. The only way that you can really know what it is to be released from this default setting of being selfish, of being all after yourself, and probably being unhappy in life, is to know Jesus. Jesus is the one who comes to bring change. Jesus is the one who forgives us. Jesus is the one who accepts us. And because of this acceptance, because of this forgiveness, because of this love, the Bible teaches us that as Christians, we have access into God's presence. As Paul, as, as Paul says, that through Jesus, by the Spirit, we have access to the Father. Ephesians 2 verse 18. We have access to God by the power of the Spirit and through the work of Jesus. God has accepted you and forgiven you. The door to walk into his love and acceptance is fully open to you as a Christian. Now, you're probably sitting there going, yep, heard that all before. I can tick that off my list. I know all that stuff. It's rudimentary Christianity. That's Christianity 101. But here's the question. Does your life look like you know that that is true? Does your life display God's love and acceptance over you? Are you living out of a position of being found in God's love and acceptance? You see, many of us will hear this truth as Christians, but we deny ourselves the opportunity of experiencing it. It's kind of like turning up at a close friend's house and the door's open. Maybe they're in the back garden or they're in the back room and they shout, come in, the door's open. But instead of taking up the invitation, you decide that you're going to wait outside the door of their house. You wait outside. Why would you wait outside and not enter into God's love and acceptance? Why is it that as Christians, sometimes what we do is rather than stepping into all that God has promised us, we stand outside the door? Well, let me give you three, three things that we might be uh, doing that means that we stand outside the door and we don't take on God's love and acceptance over us. Well, first of all, we might mistakenly believe that God should come out and answer the door. If we misunderstand the sovereignty of God, that's God's ability to make decisions and do what he wants, we can end up believing that either God exists to do what we want him to do or that we need to wait around until he speaks and acts even though he's probably already spoken and acted already. And I think that includes knowing his love and acceptance. So we might pray something like this, God, show me that you love me. God never, you know, you might say this to a fellow Christian, God never shows me that he loves me. And God says, well, I have shown you my love. I've shown you my love in Jesus. Come and experience my love. You see, Jesus doesn't just say, ask and receive, because he does say that. He says it in Matthew, ask and you'll receive. But he also tells his disciples to go and do. There's a part of our faith that is not just receiving something and asking for it, but it's also walking into it and doing it. See, we can end up believing that God or his people, the church, should be doing everything for us as Christians. And then what we do is we don't accept any personal responsibility to step in to what God has spoken to us or the identity he gives us. And then we fail to change, we fail to grow, we fail to learn. Some of us don't continually experience the love and acceptance of God because we're waiting for him to do something that he's already done. God invites us to come into his presence. And so you have to be active in that. The invitation is there, but you have to take it up. If we expect to God to do everything for us, what happens is our behavior results in frustrations towards him and frustration towards other people. Because we think people should be doing something they shouldn't actually be doing in reality. And the Bible says that we need to speak the truth in grace. I think so often what we tend to do is we tend to just speak grace and we don't speak truth. And so I'm saying all of what I'm saying to you now as somebody who loves you and wants to see you grow in Jesus. But some of us really do need to stop looking to other people for our walk with Jesus and start taking some personal responsibility. As Paul says, it's time to get off the milk and start eating some solid food. You see, God's given you all that you need. But for so often, what we tend to do is we expect other people to do things for us rather than step in and take hold of the promises that God has already spoken over us. We need to walk into the promises he has spoken. And that's an active process. And I'm going to talk more about how you can do that in a few minutes' time. 
So that's the first thing. Maybe we're standing outside the door and realistically, it's just because we're lazy and we're expecting God to come and answer, even though he's asked us to come in. The second one, and this is a bit deeper, maybe we're worried about what will happen if we step inside and we step into God's love and acceptance over us. And often that can be because we've experienced um, traumatic experiences in our past with humans who maybe haven't accepted us. Maybe we've experienced rejection or abuse at the hands of other people. And what happens is we transfer those feelings onto God and we think, well, God can't possibly love me because they didn't love me. Or what happens if I, if I open my heart up to God's love and acceptance over me? What happens if he, I feel rejected? What happens if I feel that way again? So what we, don't, we decide to do is rather than step into all that God has for us, we stay outside it. We say, well, I'm, I'm going to stay outside of that because it seems safer out here than to go in and find out what might happen if I actually enter into all that the Bible seems to teach me about this. So that's the second one. Thirdly, maybe we stand outside because we're listening to another voice in our ear telling us we don't deserve to go inside. You see, the, the, the God's got a, an enemy, the devil, and the enemy wants to tell you that you don't deserve to go in. And he will continually whisper those thoughts into your mind. There's a voice whispering to you, God doesn't love you. Some of us are maybe here today and you're here and you had that voice whispering to you on the way to church this morning. Why would you go to church? You don't deserve to go to church. You're not good enough for the people that are there. Don't tell people what you do with your life. God can't possibly love you. These are all lies. This is not what the Bible teaches us. But so often we can listen to the lie that we hear that we are not good enough for God. It's true we're not good enough for God, but Jesus has made us acceptable. So where are you this morning? Are you enjoying knowing what it means to be a loved, accepted son or daughter of God? Or are you standing on the outside of the house, even though the door's open and you're not going in? Where are you this morning? Because if you do step into his love and acceptance and his forgiveness over you, what will happen is, is it will change dramatically how you live. It will change how you relate to God, how you think about yourself, and how you think about other people. And this is quite a good way of actually working out whether I am walking in it. Because you can say, oh, yeah, no, I feel I'm, I'm through on this. Or maybe you think, no, I can see myself in some of these things. Let me just go through these really quickly with you. First of all, it changes how you relate to God. You see, if you've walked into God's love and acceptance, what will happen is, is that you won't walk in one of two extremes. So if you're not walking in love, you'll either walk in license, that is just doing whatever you want to do. You think, well, it doesn't really matter, so I'll just do whatever I want to do. Or at the other end of the extreme, which is what a lot of Christians end up doing, is we walk in law. We try and prove to God that we deserve his love. So we think we need to religiously do certain things every day. Oh, I must read my Bible for 20 minutes. I must pray for th three, three hours. I must, do, I must do that. I must do this. I must, I must, I must. So it's not out of desire, but it's out of, out of, you feel like you need to do it to prove to God that you're worthy of him. That's law. Actually, we're called to walk in love. We're called to live out our relationship with God in love. I love reading the Bible because I love being close to Jesus. It's not, a, it's not a, I must, it's I want to. That's the first thing. It will change how you relate to God. Secondly, it will change how you think about yourself. If you're shaped by God's love and acceptance... Your self-worth, your self-confidence, and your identity will be shaped differently. How you think about who you are won't be shaped by others' expectations of you, by the culture around us, but it will be shaped by what God says about you. How you think about yourself will change. And lastly, it will change how you relate to other people. And I think this is really significant. You know, sometimes I think we do certain things and then if we take a step back, we go, oh, maybe that's just because I'm not acknowledging my love, that I'm loved and accepted by God. Let me give you some examples of that. How you relate to other people. So if you're loved and accepted, you don't need other people's approval. You don't need to prove anything to anybody. If you know that Jesus has approved of you, you don't need to prove yourself. You don't always need to win the argument. Man, I... I, when I was growing up, I, I've realised this recently because my children just want to argue all the time at the moment. They are such hard work, I have to say. They just want to win every single argument with us all the time. It doesn't matter what it's over. And I was exactly the same growing up. 
I said sorry to my parents publicly in the first meeting they were here today. Oh, man, I just wanted to argue all the time and win the argument. You know, if we're children of God who know his love and acceptance, we don't have to win the argument. Maybe you're in arguments all the time with somebody at the moment. Think about, are you living in love and acceptance or are you just trying to win? You don't have to be better than everybody. You don't have to have all of the answers. You know, I'd love to have all the answers for you on everything, but I'm loved and accepted by, by God. I don't have to have all the answers. I know the one who has all the answers, but I don't need to have them all myself. I don't want to be fearful. I don't need to be fearful of others if I'm loved and accepted by God. I don't need to be scared of other people. Fear of man happens because we're not understanding that we're loved and accepted by the Father. And lastly, we don't need to try and control other people. Is your behaviour controlling? Do you try and control those around you with what you say and what you do? Are you trying to get them to do what you want them to do? See, if you're loved and accepted by God, you'll want to release people rather than control them. Because that is the nature that God gives us. So, how can we step into our identity as those loved and accepted by God? How can we do that? I don't know if you've ever watched the film Frozen. And for about 18 months, there was a period of time when Edie, she was about four or five at the time, our daughter. And I think it's all we did watch. I can quote it to you. <laughs> there is a line in one of the songs which really annoys me. Um, it's from the song Fixer Upper. And, uh, and it says, I'm, we're, we're not... We're not saying you can change him, because people don't really change. All I'm saying is love's a force that's powerful and strange. You know the one, yeah? Yeah, yeah? okay, thank you. <laughs> We're not saying you can change him, because people don't really change. That is a lie. That is what our culture will try and teach us all the time. You can't change. So rather than trying to change, just be who you are. That's what our culture will teach us. You will see this on social media. This is the narrative. You can't change, but just be more you. My authentic self, before I met Jesus, and if I went and lived back into that lifestyle, would be selfish, rude, and lazy. Yeah? I would be isolated and alone. I, Claire would never have married me. I'd be a grumpy person sitting at home all the time. That's who I would be. But praise be to Jesus. That he changed me. You see, the Bible teaches us that God changes you. Second Corinthians says that, that he has made us, that are in Christ, new creatures. He comes and brings about change in you. But it doesn't just stop there. In fact, actually, what the Bible says is that we need to keep changing. We need to keep becoming more like Jesus. This is a theological word called sanctification. It means to grow more like Jesus. You can change. Frozen is not telling you the truth. <laughs> Paul writes this in Romans 12, verse 2. Don't conform to the pattern of the, the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do, we, how do we change? Well, we change by, first of all, encountering God. It's only when you encounter God that you'll experience real change. But secondly, we change through changing our behaviour. And our behaviour, a lot of it comes up here. It's all up here. And Paul writes about this, doesn't he? We have to start speaking against the lies and patterns of behaviour that rob us of truth, that we are loved and accepted. And you can't just do that once. It's not enough to sit here in this room now and hear me talk about the fact that Jesus loves you, you've been accepted by God, because what will happen is, is tomorrow morning you'll get up and there'll be a thought in your head that says the opposite. You have to start changing the way that you think. You can't do that once. It has to be continual. I mean, I, I, um, I, I've, I've told you the story before about I used to smoke when, when I was at, at art college, because that's what you did when you were at art college. You smoked all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I, I developed quite a habit. It was excellent. Um, and it got to the point where I was smoking 20 a day, and I was trapped, basically. I got this really awful habit of smoking. And, and I did Freedom in Christ, which is a course we run as a church, and we'll be running it again later on this year. And, and as somebody prayed for me that, that, that this, this stronghold would be broken in my life, it's like it broke straight off of me. That was in that moment. But then the next day I went to university and I got on the train. I, I, I lived in sort of southeast London and got on the train to go to Elephant and Castle, which is where I went to university. And, and, and you get out of the train station and I realised that if I walked my normal route, I would go to the news agents where I bought my cigarettes and I'd just start smoking again. So I changed the route I went to to university. In fact, what I found out was that the money I saved on cigarettes, I could then get the tube 
instead, so I didn't have to walk anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was like in the days when the tube was cheap, right? Um, so, yeah, and cigarettes were cheap as well. Um, so, yeah, it was in those, it, it, at that time, I realized that I needed to change my habit. You, you can't change unless you change your habits. Some of you, you do it once and you go, God, why aren't you helping? And God says, well, help yourself. Start changing your habits. Change the way you are thinking and behaving. Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 10. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. The battleground in your life for your ability to walk into your identity as a son or daughter of God is up here. The Bible has, God has spoken in his word and he has spoken the truth of who you are. He, your identity is affirmed in him. But whether you live in the good of that or not, it's all down to you as an individual. And it's what goes on up here. And a practical way of beginning to win a battle that you will continue to face throughout your Christian life, whether you've been a Christian five years or 50, is to continue to use God's word as a weapon against the lies that you might hear. This morning, the children... I'll let you into a secret, are learning about the armour of God in Ephesians 6. The only offensive weapon that God gives us in the armour is the sword of the Spirit, which Paul says is the word of God. It is our use of God's word as a weapon against the lies and deception that we encounter that helps us walk into our identity as those who are loved and accepted by God. We have to use God's word to demolish lies and help us to create new strongholds of truth in ourselves. You have to build strongholds, walls that are unscalable to the lies. And you do that by using God's word. So I'm going to give you a really simple exercise this morning. It's a really practical outworking of what I'm saying. And this really speaks to those who are outside the door because you're just too lazy to go in. And also those who are outside the door because you're listening to lies. And I want to talk about the second group, those who've experienced rejection after I do this. But let me just talk to you about this quickly. Here's a really simple thing you can do this week. Can we just put up the, the table? Is that all right? You can QR code this. I've made it so it works on your phone. Um, or you can just take a photograph of it or I can send it out to you. Um, what you need to do is you need to get good at learning what the lie is. So you need to be good at discovering what the lie is. So for you, what's the lie? What's the lie that comes into your head when you start thinking about who you are in God? Let me give you a couple of them just as examples. Um, maybe one the lie that you have is, I must meet certain standards to feel good about myself. That's a lie that I encounter all the time. Well, I need to do X and I need to do Y. If I don't do X and Y, maybe people think less of me. I need to work harder. I need to do more. Does it make sense? Maybe you're with me on this one, right? Well, the Bible actually says that you are completely forgiven and pleasing to God. So this is in Romans 3. It says it in 2 Corinthians 5. God has made you righteous. God has chosen you. You don't need to believe the lie. You need to start stepping into the truth. And so every time you hear the lie, you need to be able to speak the scripture back to yourself. And at first, this is going to be really like... Oh, there's the lie again. I better get that table out that Barney put up. And you'll look at it and you'll look at it for a few minutes and go, yep, yeah, that's the truth. But what will happen? After a while, you'll create a new habit. You won't need to look at the table anymore. You'll say, I know, what I, I know who I am in God. Let me give you an example of this. Um, I am what I am. I can't change. That might be a lie. Well, Colossians 3, verses 1 to 11. I'm trying to show you that you can memorize scripture. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3 teaches you that you can set your mind on things that are above and not on the things, not on the lie. And that you can change. Paul actually tells the, the church in Colossians to, to put off the old self and put on the new self. I can change. The only way I've learned that is through learning scripture. Does that make sense? You can learn scripture. And you can speak scripture back to yourself when you start encountering the lie of the enemy. So it's just a real encouragement to you this week. Some of you, I just really want to just ram this home. Some of us need to get in the flipping door. God loves you. He's accepted you. Stop waiting for him to come and answer. He says, come in. Stop being lazy. Some of us need to really start battling against the enemy's lies over us. Because he is winning a victory over you every day. And you know what? God has given you all you need to win the victory. He's given you the word. So... 
That's you. But there's also another group of people. And it's the group of people who don't go in because you feel like you've, you, there's such rejection over your life that you just feel like God could never, never possibly love you. And I think for you, I want to pray that God releases you from that. I'm going to do that in a minute. But also that might be a longer piece of work for you as an individual. So I've spoken before about how I, I meet with a counsellor once a month. I find that so helpful just to talk through where things are at with me. And we've done a lot of work together over the last couple of years. But it might be for you, it's a process. And you need to engage with that. And a course like Freedom in Christ that I spoke about earlier on, when, about, you know, I, that I did when, when I was smoking and struggling with that stuff, is a great resource. And we'll be running that as a church again this year. Please can I encourage you. If you know that you struggle with rejection and you've maybe struggled with abuse in your past, do that course. Be set free. But we're going to pray that you get set free now as we close this meeting together. So let's just pray, shall we, as we finish. Lord, I thank you that whatever you take hold of can't be taken out of your hand. Lord, I thank you that the truth of your word is that we are in the hand of God and we will never be taken out of it. Lord, I thank you that we are loved and accepted. Lord, I thank you that there is nothing that we've done to earn that love. There's nothing that we've done to deserve that love. But you, in your great grace and mercy, have chosen to love us. That each one of us who is in Christ this morning can say, I am loved by God. To the point where I know that God has died for me. Lord, we thank you that we've been loved by you. Lord, we also thank you that we have been accepted. Lord, not just as slaves, but as sons and daughters. We have been accepted by the living one. And Lord, I pray this morning, Lord God, for, uh, for us here, Lord, I pray that anyone who's feeling lazy and is just not taking hold of this, Lord, really just, I pray, Holy Spirit, just illuminate that to, him, to them, Lord, that they might know you more. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who is living under the lying accusation of the evil one. Lord, we pray that the tool that I've shared this morning will help them fight against it. But Lord, we pray right now for any brother or sister here in this room today who is just living under, uh, maybe they're living under something that's happened in their past. And it wasn't something they did, but it was something that was done to them. Lord, we know in your word, you hate it. You hate it when people are abused. Lord, we know it says in your word, you hate it when people are rejected. Lord, and you stood with them, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who is just living under just that sense of, if I step into God's love and acceptance, he's going to reject me the same way that X or Y did. Lord, I pray right now that you just release them from that lie. Lord, we pray release. I speak release in the name of Jesus right now. To speak freedom in the name of Jesus right now. Jesus, thank you that it says in Isaiah 61 that you have come to set the captives free. And so, Lord, I pray for anybody right now who is living under the captivity and condemnation because somebody abused them, somebody rejected them. Lord, we speak off that lie in the name of Jesus this morning. Lord, we pray that they might walk into your full freedom, your full acceptance as our loved son or daughter of God. So, Lord, we ask you in your precious and mighty name, would you be with them this morning? And I, I pray, Lord Jesus, for anybody who's in that scenario, Lord, that you to speak to them again and again about working on that area of their life, Lord, and that as opportunities come up here at Gateway, Lord God, to actually work on those things, Lord, I pray that you'd give them the opportunity and the help to do that, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we're part of a church family. Lord, we thank you that we get to encourage one another. And Lord, I pray that what I've said this morning will be an encouragement to those here. Amen. Amen.